So one of the big ideas from lecture one is that we've got this whole population of individuals of things we'd like to know something about, but we can rarely get access to all of them. So we have to take a sample out of that population and just work with that. Uh, so lecture two is about how to sample. We're gonna look at six of the most common sampling methods, talk about the pros and cons of each. Now I'm gonna begin with the definition. Uh, a sample is representative if, it has characteristics similar to the population. The sample is representative if it's similar to the population, if it's got characteristics similar to the population. The whole point is that the sample should be a good stand-in, a good representative of the population. So you want it to be as similar to that as possible. Uh, so I'm going to show you six sampling methods, and I'm purposely going to start with two bad methods, which not every textbook will cover, but you see them used in real life, and you should know not to trust the data that comes from these bad sampling methods. So the first one is convenience sampling. And the name is pretty self-explanatory. Researchers choose individuals. No, I only did that the first day. Uh, there are the PDFs. Yeah, for all the ones after the first, you need to print those off folio later. Uh, wherever there's a computer lab printers. Yeah. There is blank paper. If you just want to use that for today and then transfer over, that's an option. Uh, if you want to go and print it and then uh, after the lecture during quiz time, you can have the hard copy to copy off of. Convenient sampling. Researchers choose individuals that are easy to access. Basically, the researchers are lazy. They don't do put in the effort they need to in order to get a representative sample. They just choose researchers or uh, individuals that are as easy to access as possible. So that's two quick examples of this. If you send out a survey just to people that you're connected to through uh, social media, that's a convenient sample, assuming that you're trying to represent some larger population. Uh, if you were to hand out a questionnaire just to students in your major and you didn't you know, collect some of the larger diversity of majors that are on campus, you're, you're doing the convenient sample. So the pros and cons of this, there are no pros except that it's easy to do. And that is almost never a good enough reason to use this. What's bad about it? Well, if people are connected with you on social media, you've got something in common, right? You're their friend for some reason. In a lot of ways, they're probably gonna be like, in fact, that whole group of people is going to be kinda, kinda similar. Are you gonna get the diversity that you, is gonna be present in a larger population? Probably not. It would be kinda rare for that to happen. And the same thing, if I hand out a questionnaire to students in, in one major, and let's say the question is, how much do you like math? And I give it to engineering majors, they're probably gonna be agreeable with that. Give to art majors, maybe not quite so much. Uh, but, but in neither of those cases are you really representing the whole student body well. Okay, that makes sense? Just watch out for that. If you see a sample that is intending to represent some large population, but the researchers have made a sample just out of who's easy to access, shouldn't trust it, bad data. Second bad method is voluntary response sampling. Here the individual self select into the sample. So this is kind of like convenience sampling, but in a way it's even worse. In convenience sampling, the researchers are saying, hey, uh, you're nearby, you're easy, you come be in the sample. In voluntary response, the researchers are even lazier and they're just kind of making a blanket call and saying, come join the sample if you want to. They're not even picking specific individuals that they intend to be in the sample. Uh, so a couple of examples of this, uh, if you see a survey embedded in a web page. People choose if they're going to participate in that or not. I'd call that a voluntary response sample. 
call-in surveys are probably, that's probably too old fashioned. And that would be like a tweet your response to a hashtag something. Uh, anything like that where they're just saying, you know, come participate in this if you want to. That's a voluntary response sample. What's good about this? Nothing. It's easy. That's why people do it. Um, what's bad about this? Who's going to take the time to actually answer that web page survey or to call into the news? Probably just going to be people with really strong opinions, right? And we're going to see in, in lecture three when we talk about bias. Uh, in particular, you're likely to get people with strong negative opinions. People who feel negatively about something are more likely to take the time to, to respond to these. So you're going to get results that are, are biased, usually in a negative direction. So if you see something that comes from a voluntary response sample, don't believe it. You have no guarantee that it's representative of a larger population. It's very likely to be heavy, heavily biased. And in lecture three, when we talk about bias, we'll see just how strong that can be. We'll see some specific examples. The top of page two, uh, just a note, convenience and voluntary response are so similar, they're easy to confuse. This is the distinction that I make. If the researchers conducting the survey or the study, if they target specific individuals, they just don't do the due diligence they should, then it's a convenience sample. If they're not targeting specific individuals, and it's just whoever wants to be in the sample or the study can be, then you call it voluntary response. Does that make sense? Questions on either of those two bad sampling methods? All right, just watch out for those. Anytime you see data collected in those manners, uh, should not be trusted. So as we move into the good sampling uh, techniques, it's important to understand that the best sampling techniques are based on random selection of individuals. The best sampling methods are uh, based on random selection of individuals. And there's a mathematical justification for that. And we're gonna state it in a very informal way here. If you were to take an upper level probability class, you would see this in a, uh, a more, uh, with a more formal statement. I'm, I'm gonna write it this way, the law of large numbers. It says that estimates from random samples approach the true value as the sample size increases. Law of large numbers says if your sample size is large enough and it's a random sample, you're going to be really close to the, uh, the true value. The example we used yesterday, one of them was uh, Gallup was trying to figure out the proportion of Americans that support uh, legalization. We don't know what that true proportion is. They estimated it 68% from the sample. And that sample had about 1,000 people in it. And as that sample gets bigger and bigger, that proportion from the sample is going to get closer and closer to proportion for the whole population. And that's very believable, right? You probably already have a, an intuition for that. If you have really large samples and they're good representative random samples, then you should get good estimates from that. All right, so our, our third sampling technique is simple random sampling. We'll often abbreviate it SRS. Every sample of a given size is equally likely. In a simple random sample, every conceivable population or sample out of the population of a given size is just as likely as any other sample of that size of the population. So this is a very, you know, kind of fair, uh, uniform, unbiased way of sampling. Every individual is going to have the same chance of of being inside the sample. Uh, there's two variations of this. Sampling is done with replacement if individuals can be selected 
more than once. Just imagine we're doing a card trick and I shuffle the deck and I have you select a card. Well, if you remember that card and you put it back into the deck and I shuffle it and you pick another one, you might pick the same one. You're sampling out of the deck with replacement. And then it's without replacement if yeah. individuals cannot be selected more than once. Without replacement sampling occurs when individuals cannot be selected more than once. So you draw a card out of the deck and then you keep it in your hand and you draw another card. That's obviously without replacement, can't draw the same particular card twice. So without replacement, that seems more natural, right? Seems like most of the time you wouldn't want to have repeats in the sample and you do get better estimates from that, but that's actually harder to analyze mathematically. So when we get into probability, we're usually going to work with with replacement sampling, where it is possible to draw the same thing twice, makes the math much easier. But really, if you're sampling from a large population, like out of the 300 million something Americans, is there going to be a big difference between these? What's the chance that the same person ends up in the, in the sample twice? Practically zero. So with large populations, it doesn't really matter which one you do. You're going to be practically the same. Okay. These questions on the definitions, go with me. All right, so how would you implement simple random sampling? A simple but old fashioned way is uh, pull names from a hat. Put the name of every individual in the population into a hat or you know, a bag or something, shake it around, pull those out. In the old days, before computers were common, you might use a random number table. I'm gonna show you something that, that I find kind of funny. On Amazon, there are copies of an old book. I can't believe anybody would pay this much money. Probably nobody does. But this is uh, in the early days of computing. This corporation, Rand, put out a book called A Million Random Digits. And there's a preview. We can look inside. Let's take a look. You scroll past the introduction. And come on now. It is literally a million random digits. And that's all it is. And this was an expensive book and researchers would have used this as a source of random numbers to use for uh, sampling out of large populations. So once upon a time, this would have been very useful. Now it's just here on Amazon for people to come and uh, review bomb isn't the right word, but come and make like humorous reviews of it. Like uh, a million digits, they just used 10. They kept repeating them in different combinations. Don't be fooled. Or, the printed version is good. I'd rather have the audiobook version as well. A perfect companion for one's iPod. Like, this is the weirdest Sudoku book I've ever found. Most of the puzzles were filled in and they were all wrong. People put a lot of effort into these. This next guy does like a really serious literary review. And uh, he's a little bit worried about plagiarism and talks about a, a different voice littered throughout the book. And then the crassness of the bedroom scene and he filters out this part for us. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep going. I found this one afternoon years ago. And I spent a couple hours laughing at it. That's uh, a little bit of nerd humor for you. All right, nowadays, everybody's got access to a powerful computer uh, in their pocket, so you, you'd use technology. If you just search a random number generator, you can, you can find those online. Uh, I'm going to show you one that's in the spreadsheet, and this will allow us a gentle introduction into the, uh, the spreadsheet. So. I'll point this out on Folio. There's a spreadsheet module here. Click on that. It'll open up this spreadsheet, which has some data and a lot of places where I've automated some calculations we're going to do throughout the semester. Um, however, this is read only. I'm the owner of it. I'm the only person that can edit it because if we're all editing the same spreadsheet, that's going to be chaos. So what you're intended to do, go to this on Folio, come under File, go to Make a Copy. That'll put a replica of this in your Google Drive, and then you can edit that one all you like. Okay, so that's the intention. Hmm. One bad thing about that is, is I'm revising my notes this semester. I haven't revised the entire spreadsheet. So you might have to come back and make a copy of this along and along as I keep revising this stuff farther and farther in. So probably plan on doing that about once a week or so. Um, 
So once you, you've got a copy made, let's look at one of the data sets. You remember the uh, horsepower variable for a set of cars that I used in a visualization in lecture one? That came from this data set, which has uh, 93 cars. And there's also, the data is also from 1993. So it's called the Cars 93 data set. Because of the year, because of the sample size? I don't know, maybe both. Uh, but a lot of cars and then a lot of variables along the top. Let's suppose that we didn't want to work with all 93 cars, but we wanted to take a simple random sample of size four out of this. Here's how you could do that. Along the bottom here, I've got a lot of different tabs for each different kind of calculation that we need to do. I've got a different tab set up. There's so many, it's going to be kind of hard to scroll through them this way. So I'd recommend if you use the uh, menu here, you can see all the different sheets that are in the, in the spreadsheet. And let's go to the one here for random number generation. All right, so let's look in this cell here. I've already typed in the function rand between, and then I give one comma 93. That's gonna give me a random whole number between one and 93. And then I copied and pasted that uh, four times so I can get four random numbers. And let's see that these are random. If I make any change in the spreadsheet, I'm just gonna put a zero here. You see how all those numbers changed? And then I'll delete that zero. All those numbers changed again. So they really are random. Uh, if I want to actually get those to be static, and, and fix a particular sample. I can take those, I'll, I'll copy them using control C on the keyboard. And then over here, when I paste it, go to paste special and do paste values only. Otherwise, if I do paste, it's gonna put that formula. And I'm gonna get more random numbers that keep changing every time. Let me just change it, paste the values. Okay, now I've got four random numbers here. So I'm gonna take the 61st, 35th, 42nd, and 10th car of the data set. So let's see which one is the 61st. Scroll on down. Uh, looks like a Mercury Cougar. So I can record that. And then if I wanted to, I could look at the 35th and the others, but you get the point, right? I can use ran between to get uh, random numbers that I can use to select the sample. And then I can collect any data that I need to, any variables uh, from those individuals. Okay, that makes sense. Any questions there? Not too hard, I don't think. Let's go back to the notes. All right, what are the pros of simple random sampling? It is simple, uh, but it's effective. According to the law of large numbers, the probability of a representative sample and, and good accurate estimates uh, will increase with sample size. The only bad thing about this is we require a frame. And a frame is a a list of all individuals in the population. A frame is a list of all individuals in the population. So obviously, if, if I'm gonna put names in a hat, I can't do that unless I know all the names, right? I can use that random number generator, but that doesn't really help if I don't already have a list of all the individuals in the population. So to do simple random sampling, it does require a lot of knowledge about the population beforehand. In a minute, we'll see a different method that can kind of get around that limitation. Okay, uh, next method, stratified sampling. These are gonna start getting a little bit more complicated now. This one's got two steps. I'm gonna partition the population, which means you split it up into non-overlapping groups. Take the population, split it up into groups that don't overlap with each other, but then every individual is gonna be in exactly one group. And then take a simple random sample, I'll abbreviate it SRS, from each one of those groups. Start with the whole population, partition it, split it up into non-overlapping groups, 
and then take a simple random sample from inside each one of those. If my population is students, then uh, partitioning by uh, class standing or ranking seems to make sense. So I can split it up into freshmen, sophomores, and juniors and seniors. I could take 20 random freshmen, 20 random sophomores, 20 juniors, and so on. And that would give me a stratified sample. If I've got a, a lot of employees, I could split them by gender and then into full-time or part-time status. Now I've got multiple groups. I could take a simple random sample out of each one of those. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, that, that can depend on a lot of things. I've seen cases where there was a nationwide survey that was stratified by state, but it was, they were looking for some economic variable. And I think this was right after that, uh, that oil spill in the Gulf. And so they were particularly curious about the economic impact on like Louisiana, Mississippi. So they actually increased the sample size in those states so that they could get better estimates there. So there's some cases where maybe you care about a more accurate estimate in some place more than others, you might increase that. But then when you average things back together to get the nationwide picture, now you've overrepresented those states. So you would need some way to like play down their influence in the overall average. And we got an example of that in just a second. So that, that's a good question. Uh, there are reasons why you might not want equal, equal groups. All right, uh, what's good about this? This ensures that your significant subgroups are represented, which will increase the probability of an accurate estimate. And you can do a more complex analysis too. We can now do comparisons between uh, freshmen and sophomores and so on more easily. All right, what's bad about this? You want the proportions of subgroups in the sample to be similar to proportions in the population. If they're not, then you need to be, uh, you need to reweight them. And here's an example of how you might do that calculation. Let's suppose you stratify by classifying students into just two groups, either undergraduate students or graduate, like master's doctor. You randomly select 20 of each, so equal number of undergrads and graduate. You ask them how many miles per week they drive to the campus. The average for undergrads is 12 miles per week. The average for graduates is 18 miles per week. So you now need to combine these back together into an overall estimate for the entire student body, right? Is it as simple as averaging 12 and 18? Is the, is the overall estimate 15? Probably not. Why, why would you say no? Yeah, in a typical institution, especially in a place like Georgia Southern, there's, uh, I don't even know how big we are now, like 20,000 something undergrads. I don't know how many graduate students, but much less than that, maybe in the, in the few thousands. So no, this is treating undergrads and graduates the same, but there's way more undergrads. This is data that's kind of old. These numbers aren't accurate anymore, but we can still use them for this example. This splits up students into undergraduate and graduate. It also splits them into a full-time and part-time status. Now in this example, we're not partitioning by full-time and part-time. So let's combine those back together. The total number of undergrads is 15,643 plus 919. I'm not gonna waste your time with the arithmetic. I'll just give you the result of that. 16,562. If we look at the total number of graduate students, that's 4,206. We also need, what's the overall number of students? Let's combine these together and we get 20,768. That's pretty old data. I think the university has grown a lot since then. From this, I can calculate what proportion of students are undergrads by dividing 16,000 into 20,000, proportion of graduate. And I'm going to take those proportions and mul multiply those by the number of, number of miles they drive per week uh, to campus. So the calculation will look like this. I take the average number of miles driven by undergrads and I multiply by the proportion of the student body that is undergrad. And I'm gonna combine that, I'm gonna add that to the 18, 
which is the average for the graduate students. But then I multiply that by the proportion of students that are graduate students. And then if you throw that in a calculator or a spreadsheet, what you'll get is 13.125. 13.215. Notice I'm thinking about using web work. I'm thinking about five significant digits there. And that's the right answer. And that makes more sense. It's closer to 12 than to 18. So I agree with that. All right, that calculation makes sense. We're going to come back and do these uh, weighting kind of calculations more later in the class uh, in the second unit. Okay, questions on anything so far? All right, let's keep on going. Our fifth sampling method, cluster sampling. First step is we partition the population. So we'll have several different groups. We're going to randomly select a few groups. And then we're going to sample every individual in those randomly chosen groups. Partition your population. You've got these groups now, randomly select a few of those groups. And then if a group is selected, you take every individual that's, that's in that group. So your individuals are coming in groups, they're coming in clusters. Like if you're gonna pull grapes off a grapevine, you're not gonna pull off individual grapes, right? No, you're gonna find a cluster and yank that whole thing off at once. Uh, your cluster sampling grapes. A Couple examples of that. We could take all the students in the building right now we could partition them according to what room they're in, randomly select a few rooms, and then give a test to all the students that are in those classrooms. Now the classrooms serve as, as clusters. This is very common in geographical situations. If I've got a city and I can partition it into blocks or streets, I'll go uh, select a few blocks or a few streets and then survey all the citizens on those blocks or streets. Blocks or streets serving as, as clusters. All right, uh, what's good about this? Well, it's a little bit like convenience sampling, right? It, it's more cost effective. But since you've got multiple clusters, uh, you're now getting some of that diversity that you need to get a good representative sample. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a compromise with convenience sampling. It allows you to increase your sample size with a little bit of convenience mixed in with it. What's bad about this? Uh, if the clusters are too homogenous, if they're too self-similar, that's a bad thing. You won't get the diversity you need in the, uh, in the entire population. Just think about it this way. On one city block, you're probably not going to get a lot of variation in, say, uh, household income. You're going to have regions of the city where all the wealthy people live and the regions of the city where more poor people are concentrated. So it's very possible you might get an unlucky selection of groups where you get too many groups from the poorest part of town or the wealthy part of town and then you're not really getting a good representative sample. You see that problem? This would work best if these clusters, if the groups are like mini versions of the, the whole population, if they're more diverse and uh, heterogeneous themselves. All right, don't stratified and cluster sound really similar to each other? They are, so let me draw a little diagram over here to maybe help with that kind of Venn diagram style. If this represents my population and I split it up into these groups, if I take a little bit randomly out of each group, that's a stratified sample. Stratified takes a little bit out of everything. Whereas cluster, you start off the same way, you split up into groups but maybe I choose the first group and the third group. I'll take everything in the first group and third group and then nothing out of the second and fourth. 
So the cluster takes all out of a little bit. Okay, does that help you distinguish between them? Okay, uh, here's our last one, systematic sampling. I'm gonna pick a whole number, pick an integer, we'll call it K. Next step is you arrange the visuals in the population in some order. And we'll see the benefits of different kinds of orderings in just a second. Just put them in some kind of order. Third step, choose a random starting individual. Uh, between one and K minus one. And then the last step, sample every k individual after that. That's the hardest one to describe verbally, it takes the most words. Pick a whole number k, arrange your individuals in some order. Choose a random place to start from the first up till the k minus first. So it's just something kind of near the beginning. And then you sample every k individual after that. Skip k minus one, sample. Skip another k minus one, and you sample. Uh, random starting, random starting individual. All right, a couple of examples. Uh, this would be natural to use in a manufacturing uh, context. I've got things coming off an assembly line. Let's say that I pick K equal to five. And then when I pick a random number from one to four, happens to be two. So I start with the second thing that comes off the assembly line, and then I'll pick the seventh one and the 12th, 17th, 22nd. Just skip every, skip four, pick the fifth, skip four, pick the fifth. Uh, with students, I could arrange you by Eagle ID. I could begin with the sixth student and then select every 13th after that. I would be using K equal to 13. All right, uh, what's good about this? Well, it depends on the order. How are you putting your individuals in order? If that order is random, this is a lot like simple random sampling, but you don't have to have a frame. Imagine that I manage a museum and I want to take a sample of people that are gonna come into the museum during the day. At the beginning of the day, I've got no idea who's gonna show up, right? I can't make a list of the individuals. I don't have a frame. I can't do a true ra simple random sample, but I can just use the order that they walk through the front doors and I can pick the third person and then the sixth one after that and the sixth one after that and the sixth one after that. That's basically random, right? It's a systematic sample that uh, has a lot of the qualities of a simple random sample. What if the order is sorted? What if I'm trying to make, a, let's say make a study group after the first exam and I take students and I rank them by their exam score. Well, if I do a systematic sample, I'm gonna get some students who didn't do so well on the low end, some in the middle, and then some on the high end. Uh, that will ensure that it's kind of like a stratified sample. I'm, I'm ensuring some representation from all parts of the population. Okay. Now, how can this go wrong? Well, how do you pick this, this value K? If you pick a value K that's really big, like 100, and you're skipping 99 individuals before you pick another one in the sample, you might end up with a really small sample. On the, the flip side of that, if K is too small, then you're not skipping many, you're in there with a really large sample, and maybe you're spending resources on a larger sample than you really need. So here's a rule of thumb for how you should pick K. If you can estimate the population size as capital N and you want a sample of size lowercase n, use K equal to capital N over lowercase n. But that's not always gonna be a whole number. And K only makes sense to be a whole number. If this was any other math class, uh, we would just round this to the nearest whole number. 
we want to use a different strategy here. Do you think I would always want to round this up or always round this down? You got a guess? Let's think about it this way. If I had to make a mistake, would I rather have a sample that's too small or too big? Probably rather have more information than not enough information, right? So would I rather have K that's maybe a little bigger than necessary or a little smaller? Yeah, there's an inverse relationship between K and the sample size. As K goes down, the sample size goes up. So we're always gonna round this down. Even if it's close to the next value up, you'll never round it up, round it down. Reasons for that, you'll get a bigger sample. All right, so just real quick example of that. In the cars data set, uh, there's 93 of them. If I treat that like a population, uh, then capital N is 93. I want a sample of size five. Take K equal to N over N, uh, 93 over five, which is 18.6. And maybe your mathematical reflexes kick in and you want to call that 19. You have to suppress that in statistics. Uh, you got to round that down to 18. All right, and the final thought, we've seen six different sampling methods. Uh, which ones are good, which ones are bad, pros and cons of each. Uh, but somewhere in this, we need to fit anecdotal evidence, which is evidence from personal observations. Collected in a casual and non-systematic manner. I'll define anecdotal evidence as evidence that's collected through personal observation uh, in a casual and non-systematic manner. And, and what happens is you're gonna, you're gonna remember the things that were more memorable, usually the things that are more unusual and maybe uh, seem to uh, buck the trend or uh, not follow a pattern. But even though those things you remember, they're not necessarily representative of what's going on on average. So, just an example, if you hear so that somebody got COVID after getting vaccinated, is that strong evidence that the vaccine doesn't work? Well, it didn't work for that person, but is it working in general? The studies that are large scale seem to indicate it is. So uh, you gotta watch out for things like that. Okay, and that is the end of lecture two. Questions on any of that? In the quiz questions, you're mostly asked to uh, look at a verbal description of a sampling method and then try to determine which kind it is. I'm going to stop uh, recording and then we'll take maybe 10, 15 minutes to work on this.